Hello, this is Dave Lee Travis, welcoming you to the Top 10 Auto Show. This week, we continue our roundup of the top 10 vehicles from the main categories of the motor world, as voted by our panel of editors from the UK's top motoring magazines. This week, we're taking a look at the best mid sized estate cars on the market. And no, that doesn't mean this week's show is going to be a boring look at long, box shaped, slow cars. You know better than that. You know that the estate has put that image far behind it. Nowadays, estates, station wagons, touring models, Avants, call them what you will, are stylish, comfortable, brimming with technology, and most importantly, fast. At number 10 is the Vauxhall Vectra Estate. The Vectra's popularity as a company car brings what is essentially a boring car into our top 10. Vauxhall have designed the Vectra to be cost-effective and cheap to run. All those things that will make it attractive to the accountants at work. Unfortunately for the travelling rep, excitement isn't cost-effective and isn't to be found in the Vectra. Vauxhall are doing their bit for the environment, however, with their dual-fuel engines. The 1.8-litre dual-fuel petrol engine available in the Vectra can use either LPG, that's liquefied petroleum gas, or unleaded. If all of this has got you tempted to do your bit to save the planet, and let's be honest, save more than a few quid, fine, by all means go ahead. But you will need to sit down and do your calculations. You don't need to do the kind of interstellar mega mileages that you used to have to do to justify an old-fashioned diesel just to save a few pence. It's not that big a difference. But you will need to do a few miles before you save enough money to justify the extra expense in buying a car that can take LPG. Also on the plus side, the Vectra is a reliable runner and quite happy to sit on the motorway all day. Inside, the decor is not at all bad, and the sturdiness of it all guarantees the accountants can keep one in the company fleet for a good while. After all this cost-effectiveness, the residual value is low, very low, as little as 22% of the original price. But by then, the company will have squeezed every last pennies worth out of this workhorse, so the accountants will be able to stomach it. But will you? Number 10. The Vauxhall Vectra Estate. At number 9, down one place from last year, is an estate from a company who started out in 1818 making tools and saws. It is, of course, the Peugeot, with their 406 estate. If you've got a long drive ahead of you, then the 406 is the car to do it in. Peugeot have always been strong when it comes to ride and handling, but with cruise control as standard, motorway travelling is effortless. The comfortable seats with fine adjustments stop you getting stiff over those long journeys, and the recently updated and airy cabin makes the 406 a pleasant place to spend a few hours. Badge snobbery hides the fact that the 406 is a good alternative to the base level estates from the German manufacturers. So if you want to do more than just pose, then your money will be better spent on a top class 406 than a standard Audi, BMW or Merck. Of the new engine range, the 3-litre V6 is the one that stands out. But if you're after fuel economy, then look to the others. The 406 is a good financial decision, and running costs are kind to your pocket. But watch out for any surprises when you come to sell it on, as the 406's growing popularity as a company or fleet car is bringing down residual value. In at number 8, it's the Rover 75 Tourer. So, Rover is British again, and what better reason is there to buy one? Not because of a sense of patriotism, but because Rover have had it tough in previous years, and wouldn't it be nice to have a world-leading British car company? Plus, the 75 is not a bad motor at all. As with most estates, the 75 Tourer is likely to be notching up lots of miles on the motorway, so you'll want the interior to be the kind of place you'll enjoy spending a few hours. Now, personally, I prefer the interior of the MG ZT. Same layout, 
but no fake wood, no cream dials, it's all aluminium and graphite. Or maybe it's just that I'm too young and trendy to appreciate fake walnut. Though the 75 hails from the old BMW days, it does have an old English charm about it which makes you forget about its German roots. But it's still an estate, so what's it like when it comes to moving your stuff? The external chrome trim is a nice touch, as is this separate boot hatch when you want to throw things in in a hurry. But what about this boot space? I mean, after all, that is why you buy a car like this. Now that is very impressive and it's obvious that the Rover engineers have been very clever in maximising the amount of space available in here. And that's just her luggage. At number seven, slipping six places from last year's number one, is the Audi Avant. So why has Audi lost its crown at the top? The old A4 was known for style, quality and reliable performance and enjoyed huge success, but the Audi stood still too long as its competition overtook it with more dynamic new models. There is of course the new A4 Avant, which, while it has a more brawny appearance, is pretty much the same Audi but with the odd nip and tuck here and there that sets it out as a new incarnation. But it's still an Audi, and the usual refinements are all there. High up on the list of priorities in the Audi A4 makeover is the chassis, which has been redesigned and strengthened. Also redesigned is the rear suspension, which is now very similar to that of the Audi A8. In fact, Audi are claiming that the handling is now on a par with the rear wheel driven Mercedes C-Class and BMW 3 Series. Safety is a top priority with the A4. You're protected by airbags in all directions. Braking is safer and more effective thanks to ABS and electronic brake force distribution. And there is, of course, the standard Audi warning triangle. There is a huge engine range for you to choose from in both petrol and diesel forms. Most notable is the 3-litre Quattro Sport, which will do 0 to 60 in 7.1 seconds. But that'll be when it's empty, of course. At number six is the Swedish Saab 95. Saab have made 1,265 individual changes to their flagship 95. Being able to account for each and every modification may seem a little bit pedantic for any other car manufacturer, but not one that also builds jet fighters. The first thing to hit you when you get into the Saab is just how comfortable these seats are. You really do get the impression that this aircraft is club class. Thank you very much. And that impression is bolstered by the presence of this little card that we find in the car, giving us details of the car's safety. But I keep expecting to face backwards and uh, address my passengers for where the exits are in case of emergency. Or is that just me? Few changes are apparent on the outside, leaving the majority of alterations under the skin. There's barely any turbo lag in here, and that's not surprising really, because Saab have been fiddling around with turbos since the 70s, so you'd expect them to get it right. In fact, the only interruption in the acceleration comes from waiting for kickdown on the automatic gearbox. The best way to enjoy your 9.5 estate is to sit back, calm and unruffled, think club class again, on a long intercontinental flight. So you get an excellent, comfortable ride as you'd expect from Saab. But it is an estate, and their job is to move lots of things from A to B. So how big is the hold on this craft? There's good news in store for rear seat passengers in the Saab, because there's loads of room, and it's really comfortable as well. And then the boot space. Well, it's every bit as cavernous as you would demand in any estate car in this class. But there's more to it than that, because we get this extremely nifty hard luggage cover, and then this very clever system of nets and these movable anchor points to which you could tie up ships if you really felt the need to. The Saab 95 Estate, an aircraft without wings, at number six in our chart.
In at number five is another Gallic offering from our friends across the channel. It's the C5. And no, we're not talking about the failed three-wheeled electric car brought to us by Sir Clive Sinclair in the mid-1980s. This is the Citroen C5, and it uses either petrol or diesel to propel itself and has four wheels. Outside, the C5's looks let it down. It's not that it's ugly or bland, it just seems that there was little thought put into the design. Inside, however, the C5 makes amends with an impressive list of high-tech specifications. I like the look of the cabin as well. Apart from being very spacious, the materials are pretty plush, has a quality feel to it. All of the instruments are very, very well laid out. Ergonomically, it's excellent. The C5 is also full of lots of clever, very user-friendly technical touches. Things like automatic headlights that come on when it gets dark or you go into a tunnel. And apart from the satellite navigation system, Citroen have developed a voice activation unit where you can put the CD on or use the telephone simply by voice commands. Unlike its electric three-wheeler namesake, it is ideally suited for long motorway journeys or country roads, even with the car fully laden with family and luggage. And with the 3-litre V6 supplying 210 brake horsepower, you definitely know you're in a C5 from Citroen and not Sir Clive. Hello and welcome to the Top 10 Auto Show. I'm Dave Lee Travis. This week we're taking a look at the best mid-sized estate cars on the market. At number four is the Volkswagen Passat. Sharing the same platform, the Volkswagen Passat estate is a close relative to the A4 Avant. And like the Audi, the Passat has taken a good hard look at itself and done some fine tuning. Not because there was anything wrong with it, but because this sector moves on fast and Volkswagen wants to keep ahead of the competition. Inside, the Passat radiates quality, in no small part to the standard leather interior. Standard equipment also includes airbags from all directions, powered steering and electric everything. Volkswagen have supplied the Passat with a wide range of engines to suit the needs of most estate drivers. Engines. Well, you've got a choice of eight in total, of which three are new. There are four diesel and three petrol. The new ones are two 1.9-litre TDI diesel engines, one with 101 and one with 130 brake horsepower, and a 170 brake horsepower V5 petrol engine. Mm, lovely. Our advice? Go for the diesel, but they can be noisy. Although they share the same platform, having an Audi badge allows the A4 to go that extra mile where desirability is concerned. But badge snobbery hasn't had an effect on our expert panel who have positioned the Passat well above the A4 in our top 10. In at number three is the Ford Mondeo. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, that's what they say. But it's a good job the people at Ford don't think that way. They took the already highly successful Mondeo and made it better. And in doing so, have created a quality car to match the best in its class. While the design of the saloon hasn't changed much from the old model, the Mondeo estate has, receiving acclaim for its style from people who know about such things. It is also larger than its predecessor, so space is not lacking. Three adults can comfortably enjoy a long journey in the rear with plenty of legroom, so there's no fear of economy class syndrome. And behind them is a generously sized boot made even bigger by the option of dropping the unevenly split rear seats. Make no mistake, this sets new standards for Ford in the marketplace. In the first place, you're sitting higher, there's more hip, leg and shoulder room for driver and passenger, excellent leg room in the back for rear seat passengers, an all new interior, two-tone on the top of the range models but uh, black in this car with tasteful brushed aluminium around the center console and on the steering wheel it all looks very good the ride and handling is as you'd expect from ford 
any irregularities in the road surface are effortlessly absorbed, resulting in a smoothest of smooth rides. At number two is another French station wagon. It's the Renault Laguna. A Renault car actually went down with the Titanic, as Leonardo DiCaprio went down with Kate Winslet in the back seat. At least the Laguna doesn't look like it's sinking too. Renault redesigned their Toro to take on the Passat and Mondeo estates and it seems to be keeping afloat so far. The new Laguna has a more sportier appearance. However, styling such as the sloping rear window do compromise on practicality. Despite this, there's considerable space for both luggage and humans alike. Standard features include airbags at all angles, electric windows and door mirrors, a rather lacklustre air conditioning system and the added luxury of leather furnishings. Other features of the Laguna include some handy gadgetry. Now once you're inside the Laguna, the technology continues. You've got quite a clever, almost head-up display, which actually monitors the tyre pressures. There's a synthesised voice that lets you know if the tyres are going down or if you've got a door open. And there's driver passenger airbags and an electric sunroof. Now satellite navigation and electronic stability controls are available as an option, but everything else I've mentioned does come as standard. And the materials that Renault have used in this new car, well, they feel very, very good, very high quality. And it's quite a nice place to spend time. And remember that keyless ignition? Put it in the slot, press the button, couldn't be easier. All this gadgetry is all well and good, but this is a car, a form of transport, so how does it drive? Now, although this new Laguna isn't as softly sprung as the old one, it's still a very French ride. They tend to go for comfort rather than sporty performance, and it means it's a lot less firm than some of its rivals. And when you start to push it, especially on these A-roads, it does feel a lot less composed. But when you get out onto the motorway, it's a completely different story. The ride is superb and the car feels extremely refined. And as for noise, well, you've just got a bit of a purr from that V6 and a bit of wind noise to keep you company. So, let's run down the top 10 mid-sized estates of 2001 so far from 10 to 2. Dragging its heels at number 10, the boring but efficient company car, the Vauxhall Vectra. In at number 9, the company that used to make saws, but which didn't cut the stuff with our panel, the Peugeot 406. At number 8, recently liberated from the Germans, the Rover 75 Tourer. And at number 7, sliding from the top spot last year, but still a good estate, the Audi A4 Avant. At number 6, the aircraft without wings, it's the Saab 95. Motoring in at number five, no, it's not Sir Clive's electric three-wheeler, it's the Citroen C5. At number four, the Audi A4's cousin, the Volkswagen Passat. Nearing the top spot at number three, it looks like the Passat, but we like it more, the Ford Mondeo. And close, but no cigar, it's granddad went down with the Titanic, but it's up near the top with us, the Renault Laguna. And now, the number one mid-sized estate car of 2001, as voted for by the editors of Britain's top motoring magazines. From the masters of the estate car, the Volvo V70. Always high on the agenda for Volvo is safety. Their cars are built like tanks. You always feel safe inside one. The V70 has anti-lock brakes, dual-stage driver's airbag, inflatable side curtains, side impact protection, whiplash protection. This list goes on. If it's practicality and space you want, it's got to be a Volvo. It's been that way for hundreds of years. Well, yes and no. For a start, this luggage cover. <laughs> Forget it. Horrible thing. There are anchor points, but they're only in the corners. There aren't a whole rack of them like in the Saab. There is a nice little space here. Good news for smugglers, as long as customs are particularly gullible. And that's about it. Most estates spend many hours on the motorway, so the cabin has to be a place where you feel at home. Now, I'm actually quite a fan of these simple, solid slabs of controls that Volvo seem to be turning out, but I know plenty of people find it, well, rather Euro-bland. They have been to the same school of cup holder manufacture, though. Look at this beauty. Yeah! 
It's the kind of thing that would finally make you talk in a torture chamber. Whatever you say. On the road, the V70 gives a very comfortable ride. It quite happily absorbs all those bumps and potholes out there and surprisingly sticks to the road like glue round corners. So, despite those extra cubes, the Volvo loses out on power and it does feel quite a lot slower than the Saab. It's another light pressure turbo and this time there is turbo lag. In fact, that seems to be the only effect of it. The turbo basically flattens the bottom end and brings no particular benefits. The 2.3-litre T5 with its 250 brake horsepower engine will take you from 0 to 60 in 7.1 seconds, however. And if fuel economy is your thing, try the 2.4-litre diesel, which operates at a very frugal 44.1 miles to the gallon. This is Dave Lee Travis saying thanks for watching. Join me for the top 10 next week running down the chart of recreational off-roaders.